Hello, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so before we begin with our session today, I'm going to quickly introduce um, Conversations Teaching Projects in Art and Design Education. Um, my name is Sabahat Nawaz, and along with my co-director, Rabia Jalil, we've set up this platform for academic conversations. Um, we intend to archive and offer a focused approach to talking about or discussing teaching projects um, that take place in the art and design institutes in Pakistan, particularly in higher education. Um, in doing so, we, we aim to also bring together the community of art and design educators in Pakistan um, and also see how their own practices have shaped and are constantly shaping um, the academic scene in Pakistan. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand this over to Rabia Jalil. Uh, thank you, Sabahat. Uh, so I will take a chance to quickly introduce Ms. Hashmi, which, who of course needs no introduction, but um, I will, well, I'll do this a little formally. Um, Salima Hashmi is an artist, a curator, an art educator, author, and human rights activist. She taught at the National College of Arts for 30 years and was also the principal there. She was founding dean of the School of Visual Art and Design at Beacon House National University and is now Professor Emeritus at BNU. Uh, Salima Hashmi is also the director of the UNES UNESCO Mananjit Institute of South Asian Arts. So um, with more than 50 years, more than 50 years of teaching experience, um, she has so much to offer. Uh, and I guess this one hour is, is not enough. Um, she is the goddess of art and design academia, <laughs> for the lack Absolutely. of better word. <laughs> and we're very, very pleased and, and honored to have you on board, Ms. Hashmi. Thank you so much. For thank coming. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I guess that means I have something to say. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Ms. Hashmi, um, uh, would, would you like to kind of take us through your experiences as, as a young educator when you when you began teaching at uh, at the National College of Arts, and when exactly? Well, I actually you? like to go further back, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. sure, the sure. reason is that I tell people that you know I did, didn't have this God given gift, okay? That I did go through a program, which taught me how to teach or taught me the basics, and that's why whenever I think back, I realize that, you know, so much of um, my rudimentary learning came firstly when I joined NC as a student, which was in another century. It was 1960. Hmm. And I was among the second batch which admitted any girls. And there were five of us, uh, which was a bit more than the first batch, we only had two. And uh, we had a most amazing, um, inspirational beginning of mm -hmm. art and design teaching because NCA just two years before had become National College of Arts from the Mayo School of Arts, which was a real sleepy, absolutely dead place. And I remember that as a schoolgirl going there and seeing it. And if you read Satish Kujral's autobiography, you realize that it was mm -hmm. full of sleepy ustads lying on tables and swatting flies. Mm. National College of Arts was given over to this phenomenal visionary called Professor Sponenberg. And that is what I witnessed as a young student coming from Lahore College for Women and suddenly found that there was a kind of dynamism, a kind of energy and a way of working and learning which I had never experienced before. Hmm. So that then made me decide more or less that if I did art or if I did design, I would also teach it. So if I can have the first images, Sabahat, uh, I'll give you an idea of actually what my training for teaching was all about. I was advised to go to the Bath Academy of Art by Professor Sponenberg himself and one of my teachers at NCA, who was Jamila Zaidi, Jamila Zafar, as she was then. And if I can have the first images, um, you will see that I, I was put through, apart from, of course, doing painting and photography, which were my major subjects, um, we were put through the course of our teaching. And these are such a couple of images, the first two images, really, of my teaching practice book. So, and it'll give you a little bit of an idea if you can read a little bit into it as to what I was teaching. And this was in my 1964. 
uh, a year before I graduated. It was my last teaching practice. And I was mainly teaching children in secondary school. And they were mainly boys. Not all, but primarily boys. And um, it was what is known as a tough school. Um, so even though it was in the country, it was tough to do. So this just gives you an idea how you planned your lessons. You had, you know, your, your timetable, you had your age group, you had your objectives, you had the courses you were going to put them through. You described the materials. Um, and then after the class was over and you had, then you did a kind of examinations of whether actually the objectives that you set out with, mm. did you achieve them? Mm through the work. And I was teaching painting, I was teaching history of costume, I was teaching photography. Um, these were kind of my main subjects that I was doing in this school. And um, the discussion or the self-reflection that happened after you completed a class or a project, it kind of gave you a lot of lot to think about mm -hmm. and the possibility that you may have to totally change what you had planned, uh, that if you ever did that lesson again, what are the changes that you would need to do? If I can go on to, to the next images. Um, and the next, because these are roughly just... So I come to NCA as a young teacher, and this is 1970. I had already taught for a year when I came in 65, came home in 65. That was for a year and I was teaching photography, a bit of art history and a bit of drawing. Um, and I didn't really get a chance to grapple with all the things I really wanted to do. This was just after the 1965 war and uh, things were very topsy-turvy. There was no way I was going to get a position. There was also no way I was going to get paid. So I worked without a pay for my first year at NCA. I always like to remind them of that. Then I really, this is from the 19, from 1970 when I really, you know, got my teeth into it. So what's so special about this? Nothing today. It was very special then. Um, the first thing that I did was to really prepare um, what I wanted to teach. In this particular case, it was the notion that light makes objects visible. And consequently studies what our light does to an object. How do tonal values occur? None of this was ever articulated, I have to say. Um, in the way these subjects were taught or drawing was taught at NC. I mean, it may sound weird to somebody listening now, but when I decided to paint these objects, and these some of these things had been lying in the cupboards from Swarenberg's time, you know, the pyramid, the cylinder, the hexagon, the cube. I had them all painted white. I also brought in a bunch of bottles and she painted them white, other objects that I painted white. And my colleagues were a bit sniffy as to what does she think she's doing. Um, so this particular drawing class image that you're looking at, the students are not using drawing pencils. They're working on the floor, which is a requirement, um, which also you know, raised eyebrows. None of this is new now, I have to say, but I got the students to do at home with pencil or charcoal prepare uh, values, value sheets. So each person came in with a you know, rectangle made of a tonal value, ranging from just almost white to very dark. And they didn't know what they were going to do with it. They were just supposed to bring it into the class and they said, okay, another sheet of paper. And I said, okay, so no pencils, no charcoal, nothing with what you brought that you tear up or cut up and you put down what you're looking at. Mm. Um, this was something that seems very ordinary today, but at that time, to try to make students match what they were looking to with the tonal values that they had brought from home, mm. and to look at tone as it falls on a surface in terms of the shape that it creates, was something that was unheard of at the time. Um, and there was quite a lot of resistance from some of the students who were very deaf to the pencil and would turn out these pretty looking drawings at the end of a class and found they were quite clumsy with this way of working. 
I'm also faulted with being the first teacher who brought in collage um, into NCA and which raised again a lot of caustic remarks um, and some, some of my students, I have to say, resisted, like Shai Jalal, who also told me, I used to hate it when you used to decide that, okay, we're going to do collage in a drawing class. It was an unknown thing. Mm -hmm. um, next, could I have the next image? Mm -hmm. We were also, of course, looking at the gradations of tone. Because when you introduced artificial light, the drama of the tonal values and contrast was quite different to when you just had natural light. Mm. Um, and therefore, you were looking at um, how light creates not only objects, you see objects, but you also creates gradations of tonal value. So you're taking apart what today seem very obvious um, things to recognize and to notice in drawing classes, but it was not so at the time. Mm. Um, you know, a, a basic drawing class was you dumped two bottles three apples and a bit of drapery and told them to draw. Mm. But there was none of that in any of my classes. Next. Mm. There was a question of shifting positions. I mean, I had resistance. I remember once from a Saudi Arabian student who said, I was not brought here to sit on the floor. Mm. So I said, you know, considering you come from the desert where most people anyway sit on you know, sand, what's your problem? I, I'm happy to say he never came back after the first semester mm -hmm. of my class um, because he'd, he thought he had come to um, and to do architecture. Mm -hmm. I should say here that I taught foundation drawing for almost 22 years. Mm -hmm. And therefore, every student who went through MCA, to architect, designer, or artist, had me to contend with in foundation year drawing. Many, many years later, I have met innumerable architects. I don't want to comment on their professional practice, but they certainly said you taught us how to see, which was all that I was trying to do, not trying to get them like wonderful masterpieces. Next. Mm -hmm. Or something like this, mm -hmm. where I'm asking them not to look at the objects, where I'm asking them only to look at what is around the objects. Mm. In other words, teaching them how to understand figure field relationships. We are often taught there's something called background and something called foreground. Well, none of that. There was field in the figure and whether the figure was a bottle or it was a ball or it was a cube, you were supposed to disregard it and only work at the field. Mm. In this case, to make matters simpler for them, I bought striped deep drapery and put it there and plonk these white objects on it. And they were only to look at the lines of the drapery. Mm. And it was, I mean, forcing the muscles in the eye to work was mm. a tough thing for the notion of how you go about the business of drawing, the general, the, the mm. pervading notion of what you do uh, when you enter a drawing. So I think that breaking down the components into the process was something that was very much part of my way of working and which was not acceptable to most people who were my colleagues. So therefore I had to write it down. And my written syllabus, which I used to head in, hand into the head of the department to Harley Kualsaab and used to give a little smile since so I was probably the only teacher who ever did that during his mm -hmm. tenure, which was a long one. Um, but I wanted to, to underline that there was a particular academic purpose to the activity and it related to the mind as much as it did to the hand and the eye. And therefore, I would not often not intervene when artists, when the students were working, but only drew together these threads when the class was over and we actually looked at everybody's work, which was up on the board. And people were encouraged to actually talk about what they had done, mm -hmm. which was again, something that was not usual um, in 
you know, drawing classes per se. But generally speaking, at NCA at the time, yes, there used to be what they used to call a jury, mm. which usually was a teacher holding forth. Mm. Well, I tried to restrain myself from intervening while the students struggled to actually explain what they were trying to do. I think that that was something that whatever I taught, I mean, I've just given these couple of basic images to show my, my process um, as a young teacher. And um, my struggles were struggles because I didn't have much empathy from my colleagues who were not used to this way of actually organizing the day. And therefore, um, the only ally I had was really the students and their work. Mm -hmm. Because the work itself used to demonstrate mm -hmm. that the process was something that did produce results. And therefore, I was pretty chuffed when you know, Professor Khalid Iqbal asked me to set up what he called a provocative still life for the third years. Um, I think, you know, he being somebody who was very, very aware, um, wanted in his own way to encourage me. Mm. But didn't quite want me to go too far. But so when he said, you know, do a provocative still life, I did do a provocative still life. It consisted of sending for pumpkins from the market, Tullington Market, and producing and putting grouping uh, vegetables or fruits in terms of their color, and then putting in as a field a highly colorful rug with basic colors, the primary color stripes. Mm. So therefore, they were looking and relating the basic colors which were in that. And I still have one of the works, or what was then, I think, my second year student. Um, it's on, on my walls. And uh, he was eventually the painter, Anwar Said. Mm. And, you know, when he comes and has a look at that second year work, he's quite delighted. Recently, he restored it for me. Um, so it was prodding the student to really go beyond a fairly um, convent. I won't. I don't want to use the word conventional, but I'll say routine mm. way of working. Next, Mrs. Ashmi, can I say something at this point? Um, yeah. You know, yes. because uh, these slides look so familiar. Um, I mean, years after um, you had left. I, I remember attempting these exercises and it's fantastic yes. to see how they've been preserved, you know, the, the methodology. Uh, it's amazing, really. I'm loving these um, these stills. Um, and on that note, I, I, I'd also want to ask you about co-teaching. Sorry I'm, if, if I'm breaking your- No, no, do, 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 please, please. You know, so you yeah. mentioned here, they say um, your peers or your, um, you know, colleagues. Um, so how was it? co-teaching were you co-teaching or were you independently conducting these sessions and i was um, i was given an assistant um fairly later on at the beginning we, we, we didn't have co-teachers at all there was nobody um the first assistant i was given was actually bashir ahmed who was a very young uh, person who just graduated and zahoor wanted him to stay on and to do miniature and so he wanted, he didn't, he didn't have any money uh, in the budget to, to hire a person. But we were allowed to have a teaching assistant. So Bashir was hired to work with me. And um, he worked very hard and he listened very hard. And then all this while, he was also studying with Sheikh Shujawla and kind of um, uh, specializing in miniature. Because we didn't have a specialization in miniature at the time. But Zuhu gave him a lot of patronage. And so it was good because although I had told him that he was not to work on the student's sheet ever, but he could, you know, make suggestions to them and so on. And also I shared with him the syllabus and what the objective was. Um, but you see, he was a very, very, very young person. He was not actually a, a teacher at the time, a qualified teacher at the time, which he later became. Um, but otherwise, there was a little bit of a... I, would, I won't say resistance, but people thought I was odd, um, which was fine, which is OK, because I was you know, sort of serious enough not to worry about what other people thought. 
So who always was, you know, later when, because he was in England when I first started teaching, eventually when he came back, he was always very supportive because, of course, he immediately saw what I was trying to do. Yes, it has amused me to see year after year after year the exercises, the exercise to do with point, you know, when I used to start with Paul Clay saying that, you know, uh, drawing is when you take a line for a walk and what if you break up the line and make it into points and when you have when you make the points uh, don't make lines but make areas of tone and so on and so forth so breaking up these processes <coughs> is something I was very dedicated to yes and exactly the same or more or less the same mm -hmm. exercises continued for years and years and years um, I don't think anybody actually read the syllabus. Mm -hmm. I think they just sort of knew, okay, so you do this and you do. I'm not even, even sure if they were done in sequence because they were very strict sequence to, you know, to how I was taking these things through. <laughs> I'm not sure that that was followed. But I think that anyway, the, the purpose probably was achieved um, because taking students through a certain process certainly I think adds to the way that they understand what they are doing. Whether or not there's enough of a rich discussion afterwards, I'm not very really sure because, you know, I was I was not there. But but for 20 years, I managed, 20 or 22 years, I managed. So that's good enough, I think. <laughs> and if they've survived me, that's okay also. <laughs> so, Ms. Hashmith, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that you say this. I mean, they survived and we were still continuing to do all these exercises even now. But then, back then, you you, uh, you continue to say that you experienced a lot of resistance mm -hmm. from within your peers. Um, what is it that then kept you going on? I know, I, I know you said that it's it's the you know the energy from the students and maybe a, you know some validation from your from your seniors or your colleagues. But what was it that really made you feel that this kind of radical transformation you was going you were going through at that time was in the right direction? I think my interest was the radical transformation in in students' understanding of what they were doing. I was really not looking at it from the outsider's point of view but rather from the insider's point of view, because I saw transformations happening from students who normally would not be able to do um, what would be considered a nice looking drawing. But when they were working in a totally different process in which that kind of um, accomplished use of pencil, or for that matter crayon, was not a requirement what was required was an intense way of understanding what they were doing and producing something that surprised them and made a student whose conventional drawing would be normally zilch suddenly see that he or she was capable of doing something which, which deserved a great deal of notice and praise. Absolutely. You know? We have been having other ways of looking at things and creating. Yes, yes. From multiple, multiple and also, ways. I think that it surprised people who were used to being conventionally praised for, you know, yeah. making something look like something else. Mimesis mm -hmm. being, you know, the the ideal, if you like, yeah. mm -hmm. and discovering that it was not the ideal, mm -hmm. but you know, something else. So therefore, I think that. Um, the, the validity of what was being attempted was certainly certified by the student's work, which I used to make a point of putting up on the board, displaying, uh, and giving, yes, certain students who were more sophisticated and were quick to catch, their work would be up, but also would be up of the person who, to me, had made the, the great leap forward and had moved from a very timid understanding of what the visual process and material was about to producing something because they had thought through the material to do something that surprised them. And that I enjoyed a great deal myself. So that was, you know, that was something that gave me um, a lot of satisfaction. And I think it taught a lot of people how to actually see, mm -hmm. which was the whole point of the mm -hmm. exercise. Um, this image, which I just wanted to show you, because I'm very proud of this. I'm also proud of it because I was very, I was vilified by 
some of my colleagues who said that I was ruining the institution by allowing something like, and, and it was actually in, in writing a complaint to the Board of Governors about me. This was, this was when I was principal. I just got the chance because a very wonderful former graduate, Nilofar Akmut, proposed from London that what, you know, would you be willing to do this? Would you risk this? Which is to bring artists from different parts of the world, not just artists, but designers, other kinds of practitioners, and do a workshop, a two, three week workshop at NCA, which we wouldn't need to spend money on because they would come funded from various sources and we would raise funds. Except that the notion was that it should not be foundation year. There should be students who'd spent a year or two there and it should not be from one discipline. We were blurring the boundaries. So we had this workshop we, in which we had students, second year students from architecture, third year students from design and fine art, and 15 of these artists, 14 or 15 of these, I won't say artists because some of them were, you know, product designers, somebody else was a performance person, etc. And we gave each of them a group which consisted of a mixture of students. So for the first time after foundation year, these students were in a group and learning with their peers from a different discipline. And um, they were working with somebody who probably they, was not from their discipline at all. We had Lee Wen, who was a performance artist from Singapore. We had an industrial designer from Japan. We had, you know, teacher of drawing from the Slade. We had, I mean, we had people from America, from um, uh, USA, from um, UK, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, you know, all over the place. And Nilofar found them, and some of them became extremely well-known people, practitioners later on. Uh, I met some of them in different parts of the world, and they all remembered NCA and their experience with these. And each one of, the, one of them had about 15 students, and uh, there were these 15 groups. And we had a timetable in which they didn't do the workshop all the time. I uh, arranged for them to see films at that time in what was the American uh, Center. And they would spend the whole day watching things like Hiroshima Mon Amour or, you know, some cla film classics and that they would otherwise never be subjected to, without <laughs> subjecting them to that. So it was, it was a three week um, experience. We did have a couple of teachers who were local also. We had um, Ijaz Malik, uh, who just come back from France and had started teaching interior design. Um, he made people listen to a lot of music, et cetera, et cetera, and made them, um, made them actually make work, which was a material music, if you like. Um, and then we just produced um, a catalog and uh, we had these posters up. I have never had such a feedback from students ever, in which for so many years later, students who, who are graduates, of course, would come up to me and said they were the best three weeks of their life at NCA. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was, that was a kind of an experiment that I wanted to patronize because I didn't conduct it myself. There were other people doing it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to patronize to demonstrate that there was what one professor, Professor Sponenberg, always told us that all of the arts were interrelated and you just had to find the pressure points in which they could actually collapse into one another. Mm. And this workshop to me, so many years after I had first encountered NCA and encountered that philosophy, um, and because I had noticed the most unfortunate tendency in NCA by this time, which was to totally separate all these all these departments where people had built little ramparts around what they were teaching. And um, there was no interaction. In fact, there were little fiefdoms. And that was not to me what NCA or what visual education in any of these fields should be about. It yeah, should be about fluidity. 
Sorry, did you say that you were you were principal at the, at the time this was conducted? Yes, for this workshop, it I could only accomplish it because I was, I was going to say, I was going to say <laughs> that how difficult it would have been had you been teaching um, and not in the position of an administrator. It would not have been possible because I'm telling you there was a written complaint about me to the board of governors that I was trying to destroy the education program mm -hmm. of National College. Art. You know, given sent by no less than a head of department. Okay, so um, I was able to railroad it because I was in a position of authority at that time. Um, but my my vision was exactly what the vision of NCA was when I was I came there as a student, and therefore I felt that I could, in all honesty, say that this was what NCA was originally about. It had lost that sense of connection between all of these disciplines mm. out of academic laziness or out of lack of drive or conviction mm. um, or because enough people as you said you know if you're just a teacher and you're trying to do something like that sometimes i mean i did it as a very young teacher also because i would go up to a teacher from another department and say you know can we do something together and I was doing that all along, but this was at a totally different scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it meant that the students were credited and they gave, got credits for what they did. Mm -hmm. um, their heads of departments were not entirely convinced and were not very happy because they felt I was taking a chunk out of academic program. But I think that the students benefited to such a degree uh, that one could, you know, forget about bureaucratic uh, wrangles. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, I mean, I can't say I would do it the whole year round, not at all. But I think that this kind of an experiment, and we have done it at BNU mm -hmm. later, um, is something that one should at least be able to demonstrate that there's a possibility of doing it mm -hmm. and achieving certain ends. So, um, you, you know, because one of the things that you asked me to talk about was teaching blocks. Yeah. And this is, you know, precisely what it demonstrated. Yes, we had gone over to teaching blocks at NCA several years previously. That also met with a lot of resistance. And that was really an initiative for people like Zohra La Clark and Nasir Shadaullah and mm. a lot of support from somebody like myself. But it got quite a lot of, um, we were never able to do it in the architecture department. Um, it was followed half-heartedly by design department, but the finance department was some was an area uh, which you know gave in to following it um, because when NCA when NCA became NCA, students didn't do specializations until their final year. Um, I mean, design department students, I mean, they knew they they were a separate department, but um, they did all the subjects, all the specializations until their fourth year. In the fourth year, then they did their specialization. So it was not that we were doing you know, something extraordinary, but it was deviating from what had become the pattern. I think one of the things that has been of my interest is really is to constantly re-examine and put under a microscope what your teaching program is, what are your objectives? Do the objectives need realignment? Do they need discussion? Do we need to look at other places doing other things, exciting things? Um, so the teaching block um, as an idea came in really the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. Early 90s, it started being put together. Um, but uh, it was, it always is. It's not as though it's easy for anybody, but these are always struggles that are ongoing in any institution. Mm -hmm. But you need enough of her, uh, enough bolshies mm -hmm. to keep it uh, going. No, no because... talking about yeah, yeah, sure. Go on, go on. Okay, so we're talking about kind of stirring what was happening and always kind of kind of questioning. Um, uh, you 
you did introduce uh, extracurriculars and then also kind of stepping out of school premises um, uh, uh, for, for another kind of learning. Um, and I do think that you have uh, content for that in the PowerPoint also. Would, would you like to take us through that? Yeah, sure. Can we have some more of the images and I'll quickly go through some of the things that led up to that. Um, so, so, you know, this it's always thought that, okay, a study tour is sort of, you know, fun and games. Um, of course, it's partly fun and games, but for me, especially, we can just run through the, two, the next two slides. For me, especially, uh, the notion that um, you are moving out of the country and going to another country, that had happened, you know, in, in 71, I was part of a student tour that went from Balochistan into Iran by coach and then went into Afghanistan and came back via, the, you know, uh, through Peshawar back. So it was... And that was in the in the tradition of NCA because right from the beginning, uh, somebody like Sponenberg introduced study tours to go and work hard at documenting what is there. So Savart was one of the places that was done under his tutelage and sin. And the, the, the collections at the Lahore Museum of Swat have been done by National College of Art students who did measured drawings of the old mosques no longer there. They don't exist anymore. But all of that was done. I was part of the work at Uch Sharif and pushing, you know, that project further that it should happen. But um, going to India had another objective. I think in the context of South Asia, which is something that has always interested me as a region, the fact that there were problems vis-a-vis what are we going for? You're going taking a group of students who always, um, can you go back to the, uh, the earlier one? We're all taking students who've been brought up on anti-Indian rhetoric since day one. So the obje objective was taking you out of a social political milieu and cultural milieu and going into somewhere else and then figuring out what it is that was common. What was it that was part of the same heritage but also certain things which have to do with the wider objective. And for me, that objective is peace. Without peace, there can be nothing. No knowledge production, no education, no kind of development. For me, the larger context of all human endeavor is peacemaking. And so for me, this, these trips which we started in 1986 was the first one we took. Never happened before that. A group of 40 artists and students go from an institution to India, I'd never heard of. And it continued after that because we built kind of bridges where it was possible until recently when it's come to a big full stop. But we were invited by various groups and those connections continued. And they continued and they built professional expertise in Pakistan, I feel very, very strongly. So much of the development of our art scene happened because of these connections. Um, so therefore, to me, the objective was not just, you know, having a good time and seeing some great places and doing shopping, but something else. Next. So there's also the business of learning outside the classroom and putting your studies inside, um, in the outside. And so in, extracurricular activities was something that I, you know, even then that one year when I taught from 1965 to 66, um, I started the idea of doing performance, um, which before that was didn't really hold so good. So we did, uh, we were lucky that the, you know, Madame Liu Xiaoqi, the wife of the president of China was coming and we had the opportunity to do something in which we use music and performance and clothes and all the rest of it to present Pakistan. And this, you know, I continued pushing. When I came back, I started the puppet group at NCA because puppetry was something very dear to me. I'd grown up as a child with it. So insisting first give, used to give lectures on puppetry in the foundation year, and then got the students to get interested and eventually founded the Alhambra Puppet Theater Group. And then people like Faru Kesar and all the others, they went into puppetry in a big way. Um, in the same way as movement and mime, because I was 
I did a course in you know, dance when I was a student in England. I was a great fan of Marcel Marceau. And so bringing Mayim into NCA, and that was the one way we circumvented a lot of the bands during Ziaul Hat's time because no dance was allowed. So the mime took off. Mm. And to me, using the body as part of art making, design, and architecture is tremendously, in, in, it's intrinsic to the way that you approach your subject. So therefore, you know, preparing for something fun like the annual banquet or a welcome party or whatever, but using all of those things that came out of the studio into this activity is something that I was very clear about had, you know, academic purpose. Next. No, it's fascinating, uh, Mrs. Hashmi, because this culture still, it's, it still is there. Um, yes, and is. yeah, and I'm just thinking that, um, you know, to maintain this balance between an administrator and also taking sides for the students. Um, because I remember in our times, there were so many um, quarrels and so many arguments. Um, is the Western, Eastern, yeah, you know, different functions <laughs> that, that still happen. So it's, it's interesting to see how this has sustained over the, over the number of years. Sustained and sometimes over, overpowered because some students uh, come in at four o'clock for these societies and we, we can talk about that another day. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, because you see, if that is happening in which students are coming just for the other activity, it uh -huh. shows something wrong is happening in the studio, that the studio is so darned boring. No, I mean, this to... <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, when there's a disconnect, and there can be a disconnect, and it's not dependent on one teacher, right. it's really on the culture that is developed. Mm -hmm. And when I became the principal, and I saw that people were not showing up for class, or not coming to class at all. Um, well, then I did what I used to do, which I used to go into the hostel and put pull the resize of the boys who are lying there nothing next to nothing, okay? And say, get to the classroom. And I did that. And uh, mind you, I had some teachers who were my colleagues in architecture department who were brazen enough to say to me, why does a student have to come to the studio? Mm. And, you know, there's no answer to that, except that the studio is a place of learning. And you're supposed to shoulder your responsibility and the student has to shoulder theirs. And I have to say that there was a change of culture in the four years that I was there and eventually made students realize the importance of what they were doing in the classroom, mainly because I used to walk into all kinds of classrooms and start a dialogue, you know. Uh, this image I've just put in, you know, as a little period piece, if you like, because one of the things that I did when I came back from England was uh, at that time, I mean, this kind of photographic image is unknown, okay? Um, I brought line film with me. I was a photography person. I brought line film with me so that I would translate my ordinary negatives onto line film and make images like this, which intrigued the design students especially, you know? And they then, you know, took on for this thing. But for me, it was really, when you cut out the middle tone, and you do the drama of black and white. That is something that students from all the three disciplines will pay attention to. And they will look at, I mean, this in 1970 was a revolutionary image. You know, they'd never seen anything like this. Even in fact, when I was studying at, at Corsham in England, line film had just come, on, come in. And I was using that, you know, for many of the images that I did. And so it is one of my favorite ways of working, of making photographic images. Um, and when I look back at this, you know, I have such a sense of memory because I remember these students and I remember who they were. And, you know, right on the right image, there is Tanvir who, um, you know, was, became a, a set designer for, for films, as you know, Ned Laddu and the mother of one of the graduates, NCA graduates later. And on the left over here, wearing the, the beret, is Imtiaz Hussain, who was um, an orphan who was brought up and came from Peshawar, became very distinguished designer at uh, PTV. He passed away. Um, so, you know, you have this sense of a kind of continuity and history. Mm -hmm. You look at something like that, but each one of them marks 
a particular moment in academic change or mm. some you know image making something like that we'll have next uh, quickly look at the next couple um but my first love you know remained how to work with small children and trying to drag nca rt type students you know into this kind of a situation well we got a chance we got a bit of money from chairman wapta uh, get a good little grant for the summer we decided to do this children's workshop inside the old city of lahore mm -hmm. in the victoria school which is a large with one of the large spaces there we put up posters in the wall city just inviting children under 12 to come and the thing and i just let my students do what they want but they, they were horrified because the kids were not responding and using paint and paper and they were too scared and um they were like doing very started writing alisyam or base bakri type stuff and that's when i realized okay so i have to then do go into first storytelling mm. and poems and then the children started working so in a sense it was a learning curve for all of us inside the old city and you know we did great deal of interesting work and we put a show up in alhambra also what they did they were just telling you that you know there were parallel activities that for me were important because they reminded me mm. of uh, ways of learning mm. and the fact that it's not different and that is the same with my yeah. work for uh, ptv and this was in the 70s and i was teaching at nca <clears throat> we brought in students from nca into it faru kesar was one of the most famous ones Naira no did the singing. Mm, the little person on the right with the white face, Shahina, uh, she became a, a television designer. She now lives in Canada. Shweb, they were two. Shweb and she were the two mimes who used to demonstrate things like modern maths. Um, and we were doing sort of uh, uh, teaching of the of the Urdu alphabet, but phonic teaching, which is you know people didn't do that at the time. We got a lot of criticism for this, believe it or not, really? because we had a song wow. <clears throat> in which we ask it "tota toy se hota hai ki te se hota hai te se kyun nahi hota tota toy se good and you know had the song and the puppet is singing. We got an irate letter from somebody in Karachi that was before emails saying, you know, what are you trying to do? You trying to make teaching children to ask questions? which is why there's all this sort of battamizi on the beach when boys are teaching girls is because you're asking teaching children how to ask questions mm. so as soon as you read that letter we said we're doing what we set out to do is to make children ask got questions. to do more of it <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> so very quickly um getting you know preparing for the the queen of england to visit and see we said okay so what do we do for decor so rashid rana was given this job <clears> or <throat> referring to our colonial history so he made these giant collages can next picture also mm. <laughs> and the one after that <laughs> so uh. these were placed in strategic places where the queen could not miss them and um, we had you know, not just fine arts students but design students and people just pitching in uh to to prepare the decor for uh, the royal visit and next one please and there she is and so the royal visit is there um <clears throat> this is an earlier picture of myself and kadoos teaching and faiza but is the young uh, student there she's like 89 or something like that and she's making um uh, doing egg, uh, egg tempera which is one of the things that i came back to from the US with the idea that okay we're going into like traditional painting materials you know things like egg tempera how the renaissance painters painted because most of us when we do oil painting I and mean, we have no clue as to how to prepare services and how to do underpainting and so on so it's okay let's get to brass tacks with that also um <clears throat> next and then was of course my <clears throat> great joy was when professor sponberg agreed <clears throat> to revisit pakistan 38 years 
after he'd left it in 1961. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, he was the chief guest at our convocation, the first convocation that was held under me as the principal. And it, for me, it was a joy because he was overcome and he said, you know, this is what I'd hoped that this place would be. When he left, there were 70 students, seven zero students, that's it, okay? And we were six female students uh, in the college, very small faculty. And of course, when he came back, you know, it was a very different cup of tea. And, uh, you know, we were walking through the campus. It was a moonlit night, the night before the convocation. And he said, you know, there are two institutions that I loved and gave my best to. One was a school at Alexandria, the art school at Alexandria. And this was the other one. And he said, you know, that one has come to a bit of a sad end, but I'm so glad to see that this is still flourishing. So for me, that was, you know, uh, firstly, I wanted to play tribute to him because I felt it was his vision which put into place the Bauhaus idea mm. and continued, you know, with ups and downs and uh, different kinds of <clears throat> intakes and inputs, especially during the ZR years, and lots of things changed. Um, but still, uh, I think a certain cohesion, which was his dream. And I do believe that today very few people know where this vision comes from, because it certainly is, you know, his genius that put it together and the team that he knit together right in the beginning that continued. Um, and next one, please. And that was the convocation. This I just put in, like, you know, oh, what fun. <laughs> that... It's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and I thought I couldn't, I couldn't not put in the other things, the other drives that have really, um, they've been the, the, um, the subliminal, if you like, messages, because I believe that there is a kind of an ethical responsibility uh, that is borne by people who are in a teaching position. And I never held back from that. I did have um, a certain strong values about, um, about the fact that there's a, that's a different kind of learning, if you like. Uh, between the outside world and the inside world in academia. I feel that academia can never be cut off from the society that it emerges from. One way or the other, it will always demonstrate that. And um, so therefore, for me, it was, it was always important that I should not try to avoid um, the fact that we are citizens uh, of in a society and hopefully we'll learn to have the courage of our convictions next. <clears throat> because I think that uh, trying to safeguard what you have, especially when it came under severe uh, attack during the 11 years of Zaul Haq, and we almost didn't survive as an institution, and many came, you know, many collapsed, I mean, all of the, the teaching programs in different parts of the country and the faculties were thrown out, the syllabi were changed, um, and it was unrecognizable after those 11 years. I think this was a unique institution which in spite of many, many attempts to totally alter its course, it held together because, and here I want to really pay tribute to the faculty, because of the cohesion of the faculty. There may have been deep uh, disagreements of every kind, but I think the institution held the loyal, was held together by the loyalty of the faculty because there were cases brought against the faculty, you know, and there were attempts to make us do things that we didn't want to do. But we kept to the bare minimum uh, in many ways, but also were smart enough, I think, in many cases to out argue the attacks on the institution. Mm -hmm. So that is that could only occur when you have that kind of cohesion um, within an institution. And institutions in Pakistan, by and large, have not survived our political history. It's a fact. Whether it's a judiciary, or whether it's a bureaucracy, or whether it's parliament, they have not survived in the way that they ought to, to survive. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, 
next. So then there was a new chapter after I left NCA. I mean, they didn't renew my contract to the principal. I decided, okay, I've done 30 years. I've done my bit. I've served the government. I've served the institution. So let's take a rest. But I was not allowed to take a rest because barely I was away for a year trying to write and do this. And then I was asked to come into this team. The team was already there for the School of Visual Arts and Design. It consisted of Huma Mulji and Rashid Rana and Julia Ahmed. Um, and so, and Sophie. Um, so I joined, they had already been working five, six months. The university had not started. So I was asked to be founding dean of the school, which I joined. And it was, it was a chance to start again and look at what was required in a very different kind of school, which would answer to the challenges of the 21st century, would answer to uh, the need for introducing technology, fresh ideas, and a very radical shift in maybe redefining certain things um, in the way of teaching and learning. So I, um, I absolutely pay tribute to that original team because they had already put the ideas in place. I was very glad that they had confidence that I, being the daughter that I was, would still be able to, you know, lend them the kind of support that they needed. Mm. Um, and so we just set off. And uh, we were lucky that we got the chance to widen our horizon because of a scholarship scheme that came from the largest of a single individual. His name was Madanjeet Singh, he's a UNESCO uh, goodwill ambassador. He'd been a sort of murid of my father's and he came into a lot of money. And he just said that, you know, I want to set up scholarship schemes in all of South Asia. And yeah. this looks to me like this might fit the bill. Um, so we got that. And therefore, we were able to we were able to have students from all over South Asia. Next. And it reinforced my idea of building peace in the region that you could have that cultural interchange so that we stop being these, you know, Kuaka Mandux mm -hmm. in Pakistan and are able to look beyond boundaries and embrace the fact that actually in the region, mm -hmm. you have combined histories and so many cultural interweavings that they can be a very important part of educational development. And they actually prefer prepare you for the 21st century in a global world much better than if you're thinking in a very narrow national context. Mm -hmm. So the idea really of questioning the national narrative yeah. and looking at a regional narrative was made possible because of, you know, Madanjeet Singh's generosity and about the, 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 the way that we were, I, I would really pay tribute here to Sataj Aziz, you know, an elderly gentleman who never had truck with artists and, and he used to be very exasperated sometimes when I used to take something to him. And then he used to say, why do they have to work until nine o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. And I used to say, you know, because that is the way that artists work and so on and so forth. I mean, it was a learning curve for this old elderly gentleman, but he, because he was a very polished bureaucrat and he had lived in Rome for, you know, internationally. So he was able to take that. And of course, the the motivation for the university came from Mona Kasuri, who decided, okay, she said, okay, I want to do my bit for higher education. It was not, never meant to be a money-making institution and still is not. It ran in the red for 14 years. I think it's just beginning to break even. Just, and that is partly because of the Madhunjit scholarships that bring uh, money and students of every kind into our fold. So, so yes, it makes it so interesting. the final thing I wanted to do talk about is just that we were able to do this to bring cultural multiculturalism next the last yeah. image. Mm -hmm. And this kind of epitomizes it, you know, Sajna Joshi is now doing her PhD in Berlin from Nepal, uh, with one of her works, mm -hmm. one of her final year works. Um, so yeah, this, you know, for me, the way forward is to break down the walls mm. and borders. 
Subhad, would you like to switch? Ha, huh. thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Subhad, would you would you like to ask the next question because I have a few before we kind of wind up, but I'd like to. Sure. Yeah, um, there are too many to ask. Um, but um, <laughs> Mrs. Ashmi, it's so exciting. It's it's interesting to see how you know I was talking about how the culture has sustained how, um, but but it all starts with I think a person, just a person, or maybe a few people, who who pull things together, who keep the team together, and and you know it starts at an institute and then it expands outside in the society and in the community and so on. So it's important to for that one person to be very ethical and to know exactly what to do to have that vision. And I think you have done that um, very successfully. But Ms. Ashmi, so say that if you were if you had a chance to go back now or I don't know advise us how to take on that role. Um, what do you think are the main factors that we should consider or we should point out um, or keep in mind? Well, first of all, you have to make friends. Mm. Um, you have to have a, a small team. It can be the team of two, maybe, you know, some, and sometimes I've been very alone. Mm. In NCA, I have been very, very alone sometimes. Mm. But there was always one person or two people. Um, and for that moment, that critical moment, that was enough. Um, and then you found that once you're willing to speak up, then there would be others who would also take courage, whether it would be an academic question or it would be a wider question of freedom of expression yeah. or an even wider uh, question of trying to support a weak voice. Okay. Um, but I think that the moment to be silent is also there when you have to, you know, like Mao Zedong says, you have to outlive your enemies. Mm -hmm. So there have to be ways of maneuvering things. Mm -hmm. I think I learned that problem from my father, not from my mother, who would always wanting to go right into battle. Um, but finding ways in which you work with the, what is sometimes the lowest common denominator for a short while, but not losing sight of what the the objective is, yes, sometimes it's very difficult. Um, you want to win every battle. It's not necessary, you know, as long as you don't compromise mm. very basic things that um, should not be compromised. Surviving for a little while so that you live to tell the tale and the wider, I mean, there have been many times when there have been uh, difficult issues, both with students and with colleagues. But if one is able to, to talk and always make time for talk and to discussion, right. you know, so that egos sort of are taken out of the equation, mm. then I think it's possible. And also, I mean, the thing that we have on our side is that we are creative people. Mm. That is the biggest mm. asset that you have, that you are creators and not destroyers. So therefore, you know, and that works in the smallest of ways and it works in the largest of ways. And um, when everything is gone, when everything is lost, the work of art remains. You know, the, that line from a poem remains. That moment that was made in a photograph or in a design or a building that remains to and bears witness to the problems of the time, but also I think to the peculiar taste of the time, the flavor of the time. So that's a very privileged thing that we have. Yeah, It's a great privilege. Mm. So I never lose heart because of that. I mean, sometimes one has been tempted to throw in the towns if you get it. But then you say, no, 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 you know, that one is so lucky. And I, I always quote that time when Shakirali came into our studio, we were young teachers and I think we were giving a crit. About five, six students we had. We didn't used to have many students at that. One year we had only one student graduating in fine art. And one year there were none. So he came in, there were like maybe six or seven students and we were like two or three teachers. So he came in. He gave a big sigh and he says, you people are so lucky. Why, Shaka? You have somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. When I came back, you know, from the slate, I had nobody to talk to. And I can, I can understand because now when I look around and I see, look at you guys, and I say, my God, we've got an army. Have we got an army? 
you know, and it's spread all over Pakistan. And of course, you know, we're living in a digital age. We're living in an age of social media where every everyone is entitled to an opinion, every word, every opinion, every um, voice is heard. Uh, Ms. Hashmi, I'm curious to know your secret of what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to know that. I don't know, really. I think it's intuition. You build up intuition and um, yeah, once when you encounter ugliness, and I mean ugliness in the sense of human behavior, uh, what people are capable of, it's quite hard um, to hold your horses and to say, okay, um, to get, I mean, there is, there is my belief also, which I don't know, it doesn't come from, from, uh, faith in any higher being or anything like that, I think there is, I mean, if you are truly wedded to the idea that um, good does survive, you know, may not triumph, but it does survive. So you can kind of figure out, okay, will I muddy the waters if I say something now or do something now? Will it improve matters or will it make matters work? So you kind of Try and balance that out and say, okay, maybe for the moment it may, may th make things worse if I have my say or I have my way. Um, you know, I may be happy that I, okay, I achieved this, but in fact, it may be counterproductive. So I kind of, I mean, life te experience teaches you that really, whether it's um, actual things like projects and work or whether it's relationships, mm -hmm. you know. Um, your experience teaches you that and how to, to balance. And sometimes you make bad mistakes, which I have done. I can't say I haven't. <laughs> Try to forget about them. <laughs> well, oh, it's good this to is... kind of keep yeah. constantly reminding yourself I of know. your mistake. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> I think it's such a lot of treasure that you've shared with us, um, with visuals and with your, with your, you know, suggestions and whatever you've said. It makes so much sense. Um, but you're right. I think we just have to. I'd like, I'd like to say one more thing. You know, after um, after I knew that I was not going to stay on at NCA, um, Zahur, we had lunch. Zahur, myself, um, Mr. Well, Mahmoudul Hassan Jafri at his place. I think there was one other person from the old, we all the old guard, if you like. And Zahur was kind of heartbroken that I was not going to stay on as principal. So he said to me, let's start a new NCA. He said, you know, Shanti Niketan started under a bunch of trees. And um, so I said, yeah. So he said, let's hire a barn and let's just start all over again. And we laughed about it. And I said, I'll consider it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a week later, he was no more. So I always think that, you know, if, if there's a germination of ideas, and there are a couple of people, I mean, what you're doing right now is, is something like that. A couple of people who you can, you know, sati mil um, and you do something, and they're not wasted. Mm -hmm. You know, they may not last for a very long time, over a span of time, but it's not wasted. Because it's, it does water the ground. It does sort of, you know, something will spring from something else and so on and so forth. So that, that, that will happen. And something that, you know, you're doing right now, um, that, that is a facilitating activity. You know, you are putting fertilizer into the ground for something to, to grow. You know? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hashmi. Uh, a pleasure again. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the for, for your for your very, very precious uh, uh, experiences, uh, the thoughts you okay. shared with us. We will call you again on this uh, it, uh, in, a, in a future series. Um, uh, uh, great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank we you do. so much. Thank you for uh, inviting an old lady like myself. Mrs. Oh, Hashmi, God. as we said, <laughs> you're the <laughs> Art and design education is incomplete without you. So um, we call you again. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
خداحافظ خداحافظ